welcome back to another video in our No Code Fundamental series and in this one we're going to be talking about the first of our fundamental pillars which is databases and we've picked this one first for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's one of the easiest to understand, it's an easy one to kind of relate to and get to grips with and get stuck into. But number two, it is also the the founding, you know, cornerstone of every single no code app out there. It is nigh on impossible to have a no code app that doesn't have a database. And when we see people who um, have got stuck into no code, have ran into issues down the line, uh, quite often where they've messed up is with the database and how they put it together at the very start. So I'm just going to start by just kind of you know, understanding how databases work and how you can make the best use of them. So let's talk about what a, what a database actually is. Um, it is a place uh, within your app that's supported by every no-code tool out there that is used to store all of the data related to your app. And almost every single action that a user takes on your app will in some way affect the database. Now, um, Throughout this, this pillar and actually throughout the entire fundamental series, we're going to refer to a few different examples that will hopefully be uh, relatable to people watching these videos. And to talk about databases, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to go through an example of a company called Airbnb. Chances are you've already heard of Airbnb, but if you haven't or if you haven't used it before, I want to just give you a bit of an overview of how it works so that you can understand it. So. Um, Airbnb is a platform that allows people to uh, rent out their apartments to other people um, so that they can come and use, sort of use that as an alternative to a hotel when staying in a city. And if you are the person renting out an apartment, you're called a host. And if you are the person renting that apartment for a short period of time, then you're called either a renter uh, or a visitor. So um, it's really, really popular platform. Typically, the way it will work is somebody will come on, they'll search for an apartment, you know, maybe in London, Paris, Rome, New York, whatever it may be. Um, they will uh, type in the requirements of what they're looking for. For example, I want an apartment with two bedrooms, um, you know, really airy, maybe it's got a hot tub, whatever it could be. And uh, you'll get a bunch of results and um, you, you will eventually pick somewhere and book. And I've kind of started to talk about this a little bit down here. So we've kind of got this concept of uh, a host. So the host who owns the apartment is going to sign up to Airbnb and they're going to create a new page for their room or their apartment. And I say room because um, you can just host your own bedroom on there. You don't have to have a full apartment. So a host is going to sign up and they're going to create a new room. Um, after that, a visitor is going to sign up to Airbnb, they're going to browse all the different listings and eventually they're going to request uh, to the host that they book a room, that they stay in a room. Uh, once the host accepts that, they receive a payment from uh, the visitor and the visitor is now able to stay and at that point, uh, the visitor is probably going to say, well, I'm going to stay between, you know, the, the 1st of August and the 31st of August and, uh, you know, from there, the host will then make plans to meet them, give them the key, make a plan to meet them at the end, pick the key back up off them, etc. So our visitor goes, they go and they stay in an apartment um, and then when they come back home and it's all finished, they'll typically leave a review um, of the apartment for the host. So that's just a really kind of quick idea of how Airbnb works. Um, obviously, that's kind of demonstrated in this picture on the left. Um, you know, it's kind of obviously mentioning the host is connected to the visitor. Airbnb is clearly kind of sitting in between these two parties. Um, and by the way, just a you know something worth knowing: um, the type of business that Airbnb is um, is what we call a two-sided marketplace because essentially Airbnb is just a an intermediary or a, a way of connecting buyers and sellers. You know, the sellers are selling apartments and rooms, the buyers are visitors who are looking to rent and buy an apartment. So, you know, with this in mind, although it feels like a totally different business, eBay is really similar, uh, sorry, Airbnb is really similar to eBay. Uh, eBay is really similar to Amazon. Amazon is really similar to Auto Trader. Um, just because all of these businesses bring together buyers and sellers and help them connect and send data to each other. And that just so happens to be a type of business that no code is really, really good at creating. And it's also a really popular business type to be creating. So, 
Um, let's have a little bit more of an in-depth look at what a database actually is. So, as I say, it, it's used to store all of the information that your app needs to function. So, in your database, you're going to store, you know, everything about who your users are, what's their email address, what's their password, what's their name, any detail you need about them. If you were building Airbnb, for example, you're probably also going to store their home location. Um, you might be storing their passport number for bookings. You might be storing their credit card details. You might be storing a list of all the apartments that they've stayed in previously. Tons of different data and every database is going to be you know, completely different. Um, but one of the key things to know is a database stores information in a structured way. So up, up front, you're going to define what you call the database schema or the database model. In other words, you're just going to sit down and say, well, my database should look roughly like this. I've got users, so I need a bit for users. You know, I've got, um, let's say, a host, so I need a bit for hosts, etc. But essentially what you're doing is you're, you're telling a database what type of information to store and how to store it. And every single little bit of data that you store in there, be it an age, a name, a country, you know, payment details, whatever it might be, all of those have a separate data type that we'll cover in a separate video. Um, but the idea is just like a filing cabinet, you store that in an organized, structured way. And as a result, when you need to find that data again to use it in your app, you can find it really easily, you can retrieve it and you can make use of it. Now, the other thing to keep in mind by database, and this will be, you know, might, might seem a little bit obvious, but a database stores information permanently. If you want to keep a bit of information forever, then you must put it in your database and everything that you keep in there will stay there until such time as you or your app, you know, delete uh, information from database, change it, so on and so forth. Um, and so because it's stored in data forever, databases are optimized to store millions and millions and millions of pieces of data. You know, if you had a million users on your app, uh, a database is gonna be able to handle that. Now, in the kind of technical programming world, it's a lot more complex, you know, typically um, you'll do lots of different things, like you'll have multiple databases, um, uh, you'll do things called load balancing, which is when you kind of try and balance how much data is going into each database, um, which, if you're a programmer, you'll know is a, an explanation I've just butchered. But um, within the no-code realm, we don't have to worry about that so much. Typically, no-code tools will take care of that scale um, themselves. So if you've got a few million users, no-code is a really great way to just make sure that's taken care of and you don't have to worry about it. Um, but typically, your database is, is going to be able to handle that out of the box pretty easily. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and so as I mentioned in the first slide, you know, Almost every action a user can take is going to involve your database. It's really, really hard um, to not involve the database. So you imagine, you know, you log onto an app and it says, you know, hello user, um, or it shows some sort of, you know, detail relevant. So if you're logging onto Airbnb, the first thing you're going to see is potential apartments you could stay in. If you're logging into Uber, you're going to see where all the cars are. All of that information is initially stored in a database. So almost everything your user sees is going to come from a database. Almost every button they touch, every um, you know piece of text they enter, somewhere along the way is either going to um, pull information from a database, put information into the database, or both. So it is completely critical, and um, you will find that almost everything that you build kind of goes through this journey of the user does something, something happens in the background, and then information ends up in the database. And that's great, that's the way it should work, and it's a way that, that modern software uh, works today. So let's talk about what you actually need to know about databases. I'm just gonna move myself out of the way here. So a database is a collection of what we call tables, and a table is just a relevant grouping of information. The, the best analogy is if you think about a spreadsheet, like the one I've got pictured here. Now I've pictured Google Sheets here, but it just works exactly the same as Microsoft Excel. But if you look down the bottom there, um, and, and you'll be familiar with this from Excel as well, you know, you can always add a new sheet. Um, you can usually have within a spreadsheet as many as you like, you know, 20 sheets, you can have two sheets, you can kind of click between them and they, they change the view of what you're seeing. Well, a database table kind of works the same way, you know, and, and exactly on this spreadsheet and exactly the same way that I've got a user's sheet, an apartment sheet, a host sheet, um, you know, sheet four, you would easily have tables that, that match up to those names, you know, users, apartments, hosts, etc. Um, so that's how you would sort of group that together in a database. So if you're sitting there and um, building out an app idea, 
you know, the first thing in your head should be, well, who's going to be using this? Is it just one, you know, um, generic group of people called our users, which is, you know, the most common in most apps? Actually, do I have some sort of two-sided marketplace where I've got buyers and sellers? You know, have I got drivers and riders? Have I got restaurants? Um, have I got customers? You know, whatever it may be, um, you're going to take that data when you come to build your app and you're going to separate that out. Now, don't worry too much about that um, at the minute because uh, in a future lesson, we're going to do a complete blueprint of your app and a big part of that is how to figure out exactly what data tables you need and design them uh, to have the right data that you need in them as well. Now, within a table, uh, then clearly we have information about you know a specific topic like our users. However, in order to actually store that information, we have a series of what we call fields. Um, so a field is just equivalent of a column. Um, you could also just call it a data type, uh, but it's essentially just an individual piece of data. So um, again, on the columns on this spreadsheet picture here, I've kind of demonstrated that. We've got a username field, an email address field, a location field, a signed up date field. Um, and one thing to know about a database, and we'll cover this again in um, a little bit more detail in the next lesson, but each field in a database has a specific data type. It could be text, it could be a number, it could be an image, but the database will only allow information of that type. So for example, if you have a number field and you try to save an email address in there, it won't work. It will just say, you know, respectfully, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and it will just reject whatever you're trying to do to the database. Um, and that might seem a little bit kind of pedantic or pernickety, but the reason for it is simply because the database is trying to keep that information structured, well organized, and make sure you can find what you need. So when you're beginning to think about the kind of data uh, that you're going to have, then you'll need to also think about the field types. You know, if you if you were building Airbnb and you're going to upload apartments, well, you're going to need a field that is images for the photos of the apartment. You're going to need one which is text for the address. You know, you might need one uh, which is a number for saving the rating of the apartment, so on and so forth. But again, we'll come back to that. Now, within a database, um, you have rows just exactly like a spreadsheet, but in a database we call those records. And again, if you think back to the filing cabinet analogy, every bit of paper you put in that filing cabinet is going to be a record and a database works the same way. Um, so within a, a, a row or a record in a database, all of that information on that specific row is joined together. So if I want to retrieve information about a certain user, in this case, in this picture, let's say I want to get Joe Blogs 123, um, whenever I whenever I uh, request the user by that name, I'll immediately get access to all of the other columns on that record. So I'll get the email address, which is joe at gmail.com, the location, which is United States, so on and so forth. So um, one of the things just to keep in mind, uh, as I mentioned on the previous uh, slide, a database can handle millions of pieces of data, which in turn generally means, you know, a database could easily handle a million records with 25 different fields on it, you know, um, it, it really can handle that kind of volume. However, within the no-code world, quite often a no-code tool um, will limit the number of records your database can have. Now, these are always going to be extremely high limits, like 100,000 plus. Um, and then typically once you hit a limit, you'll have to upgrade to pay, for example, an extra monthly fee to access more data. Um, two things to keep in mind there. Number one, if you are getting to the point where you're using 100,000 uh, records in your database, um, your app is probably going to be pretty successful by then. And so, you know, the monthly cost of a, a renewal code tool will not be a problem that you have at that point. Um, so in some ways, that's something to look forward to is hitting those limits. Um, on the other hand, um, if you are hitting those limits and you don't actually have many users, etc., it probably means you've designed something really inefficient in your database and you could be saving uh, a lot of data records that you don't need to. So that's why it's really important to get this right from the start, take the time to learn it and really think about it. And again, we will cover some of that in our uh, lesson around about building um, a blueprint for your app. So... You know, just really as a as a, a kind of sum up there, you know, whenever you add data to your database, a new record or a new row of data is going to be created and each field within that record will then be populated with the data that you have supplied. Um, and just as, a, as another kind of example here of, of how to think of uh, tables and records within them, the way that I like to, to kind of visualize it or say it out loud is just, 
thinking of the table as the plural of a word and the records as the singular form of a word. You know, if I had a table about uh, books, then each record, uh, let me just move my, my little picture up. Uh, if I had a table about uh, books, then each record within that is going to be a book, you know, books, book. Um, if I had a table called cars, then each record within that is going to be an individual car. If a table called users, you know, each record is going to be an individual user, so on and so forth. Um, and so that's quite a good way to just, when you're designing your database and you're thinking about the, the, the data that you need to have in there, um, and you're thinking about the tables you've got, it's just a really good way to, to, to try and bring it to life and make sure that you're almost giving it a sense check, you know, okay, I've got um, a table called buyers and each each record on there is a buyer, does that make sense? Yep, okay, brilliant. You know, it's just a good way to sense check um, if you're designing things properly and if it's all going to fit together in the way that you want. Now, that's quite a lot of kind of abstract information. So what I'm going to do at this point is just um, hit pause on this video. Um, if you jump into the next video, I'm going to show you a demo of a Google Spreadsheets and how we sort of think about that on a spreadsheet and then we'll go ahead and take that information as we showed on the, the screenshot a few slides ago and put that into Airtable which is a um, really powerful, really robust, no-code uh, database.